Hi everyone, today I'm going to be reviewing A Memory Called Empire by Arcady Martin. This is going to be part of my series of reading all the books that are finalists for this year's Hugo Awards. I posted a review of Gideon the Ninth, which was the first book that I read from that list a few days ago, so you can check that out if you're curious. This is the second book from the list that I read, and I feel like reading it right after Gideon is kind of an unfair comparison point because I absolutely loved that book so much, and that book is also really larger than life. Like the plot, the characters, everything was turned up to 11, and A Memory Called Empire, I thought it was a really good book, but it's a much quieter and more thoughtful book in a lot of ways, so it took me a little while to get into it. I really enjoyed this book, and I enjoyed it more the more I read it, and also the more I've thought about it since I finished reading it, the more respect I have for this book and for what the author created. It's a novel that touches on themes about colonialism and empire and culture and in a lot of really interesting ways that still kept you involved in the story. But it was a little bit difficult to transition to that kind of story right after reading Gideon, which was irreverent and funny and unexpectedly kind of stole my heart as a reader. The author, Arkady Martin, in her non-writing career is a a historian who specializes in Byzantine history and she's also a city planner and you can totally see her bringing that expertise to bear in her writing of this book. She's also obviously a very talented writer as well and this is her debut novel. Considering that this is a science fiction story that's set in a culture that's really different from ours and then the main character is an outsider who's from an even more different culture experiencing that, she really captured a lot of things that are universal to human experience and how they experience culture, both uh, uh, from a modern day perspective, but as well as incorporating a lot of things from history and the experiences that people have had. The actual plot is a combination of a mystery and more of a political uh, suspense or thriller story. I mean, it's not super action packed, but there are a lot of political elements and political intrigue that goes on. The main character, Mahit, is sent as an ambassador. She is from a independent space station that is sort of just outside the reaches of the empire. The empire is called the Texacalanli Empire, and I'm never gonna say that again in this video because it's a miracle that I got it out once, but I did get used to reading it, and in general, the names in this book were actually not too hard. I know I complained about that a lot in my review of the Goblin Emperor, uh, even though names aren't something that usually bother me too much. So I'm just gonna call it the empire for the rest of the video, but you should know that it's not just a generic science fiction empire, it does have a name and she really developed it really well. I just can't pronounce it. Mahi is sent as the ambassador to the capital city slash planet of the empire because something has happened to the previous ambassador of, from their station and they don't know why or what's happened. They don't know if he is still alive or basically what's going on. They're isolated enough that they're not really up to date. And the previous ambassador hasn't visited home in 15 years and hasn't been very communicative about what he's been up to. Mahi is young and inexperienced, but she should have one advantage, which is that in her culture, they have these devices called imagos, which is basically the memory and experiences of a previous, usually deceased person implanted into their brain. And so they kind of take on both that previous person and themselves. And this has been really important to their space station culture because it's been used for their pilots, which are crucial to their survival. So Mahi should have the memories and experiences of the previous ambassador, Iskander, except that the recording is 15 years out of date anyway, but it's the best they have. But even so, then at the beginning you see it might not be functioning the way it's supposed to, and she might be stuck in this unfamiliar, very developed society without a lot to go on. I just actually want to read the dedication on this book because I think it really captures what the book is about. This book is dedicated to anyone who has ever fallen in love with a culture that was devouring their own. And that really is the core of what this story is about. Falling in love with a dominant culture that might not be your culture or might not be your native culture is a story that's really as old as history, I think, and it's something that's still relevant today. And that's really the most central theme of this novel, even though there are a lot of other ideas and concepts that are important to it. This is something that's so true and central to the human experience, and the author did such a good job of capturing it that I feel like her own experiences and background probably really lent to her knowledge on this subject. There are so many examples from history that I can think of of people that have been torn between assimilation and the culture that they're now living in, and I can think of, for example, I'm not familiar with Byzantine history, 
but obviously it came from the Roman Empire, and that was such a classic story in the Roman Empire. There are so many prominent figures in Roman history who came from a different culture and sort of wanted to assimilate, became very Roman in some ways, but were never fully accepted into that culture and always had to deal with that. And also were maybe seen as traitors to their home culture. And so that's something that's really going on in this book. I feel like Mahit is a character that really could have existed in the Roman Empire, and this is a story that could have happened in that setting. In this book, Mahi is in love with the literature and the culture and really everything about the empire, but she also always has this keen awareness that it's something that she can never really be accepted in and never really be part of. And so throughout the book, she's warring with her desires to fit in and even to like be part of this culture that she's in a way has been obsessed with since childhood, but that she knows she can never really be a part of it. I did feel like the actual characters were kind of a weakness in this novel. I liked them, but I didn't feel particularly invested in them. I didn't really feel afraid for them. I didn't feel like I had a very strong sense of who they were. I feel like the way their experiences were portrayed was really strong and very interesting but that the characters themselves are more of a vehicle through which the story was told. And that's fine. I think if I hadn't come to this from Gideon, where the characters were super larger than life, I probably wouldn't have been as bothered by the absence of characters that I cared about really, really deeply. On the other hand, even if the characters didn't totally feel like people to me in some ways, the experiences and just the moment that Martine describes in this book are so vivid and real. For example, she talks about Mahi as a a student picking a name in a foreign language class, you know, like many of us who took a foreign language in school, we had to pick our name that was going to be in Spanish or German or whatever language we were learning at the time. And having that in a science fiction setting, there's something about it that just felt so real. I did feel like this was a book that was more about ideas than anything else. And in that way, it felt more like a classic sci-fi book, even though it was described as a space opera. And I guess it is in the sense that it's not driven by hard science in the way that something that we would consider hard science fiction might be. But it did feel like it was about something bigger than just the characters. It's definitely a denser read, although I felt like it did go by quickly enough, it didn't feel like something I had to slog through. And even though I keep talking about how it's more of a novel of ideas, I did feel like the way those ideas were presented was very organic and natural. I didn't feel like the author's hand was just in there, like manipulating everything and making the characters do things that didn't really make sense to prove a point. It did feel very organic the way it was presented. One of the things I loved about this book was the way I really felt all the knowledge and research that went into it. I don't know if that's something that would excite everybody, but to me, I thought it was really, really interesting. I wanna share with you, there's a blog post that the author did uh, on the publisher's website where she talks about, uh, she calls it, six things I borrowed wholesale from history for a memory called Empire. And I kind of just want to read the first one to you guys and then I'll link to it down uh, below and you can go read the rest of it if that intrigues you. So the first one is, in the year 1044 AD, the Byzantine Empire annexed the small Armenian kingdom of Ani. The empire was able to do this for a lot of reasons political, historical, military, but the precipitating incident involved the Catholics of the Armenian Apostolic Church, a man named Petros Gedadarj, who was determined to prevent the forced conversion of the Armenians to the Byzantine form of Christianity. He did this by trading the physical sovereignty of Ani to the Byzantine emperor in exchange for promises of spiritual sovereignty. When I started writing this book, my inciting question was, what's it like to be that guy, to betray your culture's freedom in order to save your culture? Except, you know, in space. I've mostly talked about the themes of empire and culture so far in this review because I find those to really be the predominant theme in the book. But as you can tell from the title, which is A Memory Called Empire, memory is also a pretty important theme here, especially, you know, through the lens of those devices I mentioned that Mahit's people use and implant to have someone else's memories in their head. And the question sort of comes up, what is memory? And does having someone else's memories change your identity? Mahi is really comfortable with that kind of paradox of being someone else and yourself at the same time and having their memories. But to other characters, that idea is both intriguing and terrifying and brings up a lot of questions about immortality and identity and what it all really means. So that's something else that definitely gets explored in this book. It looks like there's going to be at least one more sequel to this. So I don't know if it's going to be a long series, but it might be a duology. But 
it also felt pretty complete at the end of the first book, so it functions perfectly well as a standalone. It's hard to see where the characters would necessarily go in another story, but I find everything about the setting and everything else super intriguing, and I'm definitely looking forward to the next one when it comes out next year. Let me know down in the comments if you've read this book and what you thought of it, or if you're interested in picking it up after this review, or if this review makes you think that it's gonna be terrible and you're not interested at all. And please subscribe if you'd like to see more videos from me.